All righty. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Dorothy Skye, president of the League of Women Voters of Wisconsin. Today, our state league presents the second of four webinars devoted to the national popular vote. It's titled, quote, the national popular vote dispelling the partisan myth, end quote. Incidentally, you can find the recording of our first webinar on the LWVWI website and YouTube page. Today's recording will soon appear there as well. While con attendees continue to join us, let's orient ourselves and frame this discussion by introducing a bit of context. In 1787, 55 delegates representing the 2.5 million people in the 13 American colonies convened in a hot stuffy building in downtown Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Have any of you visited Philadelphia this time of year? I lived there. This week, the temperatures there will range between 85 and 95 degrees outside the historic Independence Hall where the constitutional framers met. The delegates who gathered in that hall 235 summers ago conscientiously aimed to represent their electorate and all of us in the future. They debated in closed session without the benefit of air conditioning from May 25th to September 17th, 1787, and came up with a constitution, a guiding document for a new form of government. 39 delegates had the gumption to sign the final draft. They knew their design was, an ex was experimental. They knew its durability was tenuous. This was expressed by Benjamin Franklin's response to a person outside the hall who inquired as to what sort of government the convention members had decided upon. Mr. Franklin responded with prophetic wit, quote, Madam, a republic if you can keep it. Our constitution is held up quite well. Today, 235 years later, it continues to govern our country the population of which has grown to around 330 million from that 2.5 million. But that remarkable 18th century parchment needs a few 21st century edits. In particular, we need to simplify and improve our method for electing our national president. At the recent 2022 annual convention of the League of Women Voters of the United States, delegates voted to elevate, quote, the direct election of the president by popular vote, end quote, to prominence in the headliner list of components of the US League's 2022-24 program, Making Democracy Work. This program declares the focus of the LWV US's activities for the upcoming biennium. As our presenter for today's effort to dispel the myth of partisanship, that some tout with regards to the national popular vote, we're fortunate to have Mr. Pa Patrick Rosenstiel. Mr. Rosenstiel, who goes by Rosie, he says his friends call him Rosie, so we will too, is a nationally recognized figure in the world of public affairs, international relations, public relations, and market research. He brings nearly two decades of senior level public affairs expertise to the table and can point to a long list of successful campaigns. In addition to his work as the CEO of Ainsley Shea, a Twin Cities-based public affairs firm with worldwide impact, Mr. Rosenstiel presently serves as a senior consultant to the National Popular Vote Campaign and has visited 45 states on behalf of the National Popular Vote. Rosie, you may have been to more since that was printed. Uh, he currently lives in St. Paul, but he's a Wisconsin native and a Packer fan. So audience members, you can put your questions and comments in the chat at any time, as Molly said. Uh, Deborah Cronmiller, LWVWI's executive director and Molly Carmichael, our com communications director and I will be monitoring the chat and we'll bring forth your questions in the Q&A following the presentation. Patrick Rosenstiel, Rosie, the virtual floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Dorothy. Uh, appreciate uh, the introduction. Um, and always appreciate uh, the opportunity, um, you know, to present on national popular vote or to discuss it with people who are interested in the topic. Um, I, uh, 
I'm a full-throated proponent uh, of the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, uh, have been involved in the movement to elect the president by national popular vote from 2007. Uh, and I guess I've been invited here to dispel the partisan myth around national popular vote. And I think the primary partisan myth is that it's partisan at all. Um, I, uh, I am a Republican trapped behind the blue wall in Minnesota. Um, I uh, work with Democrats, Republicans, and independents because I believe there's a better way to elect the president of the United States. And that I believe if we adopt a system where every voter in every state is politically relevant in every presidential election, that that's in the best interest of the political movement I care about, although that's why I'm here least. Uh, but I definitely think it's in the best interest of the state and nation that I'm a part of. Um, because I think nothing like presidential elections in my lifetime has done more, um, or the system we currently use to elect the president has done more um, uh, to, to threaten the future of American democracy, which I believe is um, probably, uh, well, I believe it is uh, the best form of government ever invented by man, woman, or child um, to, to, to organize a society, right? Um, like I believe this idea of self-government, and I believe that the principle of one person, one vote is foundational uh, to uh, um, the legitimacy of American government. And I just believe that our government uh, was designed for our leaders to derive their power from the people um, and that uh, you can't uh, be afraid of the voters, you know what I mean, and, uh, and, and serve, serve the country. So you know, just I, I think the biggest partisan myth is that this is some kind of Democrat or Republican idea. Uh, I don't believe national popular vote or electing the president by national popular vote is a Democrat or Republican idea. I believe it's an American idea and I believe it's time has come. Um, just, uh, you know, by way of background a little bit on the issue, I don't know how many people were at the uh, inaugural um, presentation on national popular vote. I think it's um you know, sort of important to understand or maybe review some of the basics or cover some of the basics, um, you know, for those who weren't here. Um, there, there is a movement uh, to elect the president by national popular vote. And it's called the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, right? If you're reading the news today, you know, you'll see all kinds of people bashing the Electoral College, you know, as if somehow you have to abolish the Electoral College in order to have a national popular vote for president. Right? That's one of the biggest myths around the national popular vote. Uh, the plan that I support, which you can find at nationalpopularvote.com, is state-based action that leverages the power in the Constitution that Dorothy was talking about. Um, in Article 2, Section 1 of the Constitution, it says that each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors. Right. So to change the method with which um, the various states award electors does not require a constitutional amendment. It, uh, it requires simple state action and nothing simple about state action, but it means that if you can get enough legislatures to agree that we will elect the president by national popular vote, that can occur without getting rid of the electoral college. And frankly, I would argue that if you're a proponent for the national popular vote, or if you're a proponent of uh, the candidate who gets the most popular votes in all 50 states being elected president of the United States, there's only one way that's gonna happen in my lifetime, which is the plan that you'll find at nationalpopularvote.com. Now, the reason I say that is not bravado and it's not self-serving, uh, but it is because it's the effort that I've been working on since 2007 that's been adopted by 16 states, right? Or 15 states in the District of Columbia that acts like a state in presidential elections. So the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact is not a theory. It has been passed in 16 states with 195 electoral votes, right? And that agreement goes into effect when there are states with 270 electoral votes that have that plan or that bill in place in their states. So for example, if, if Wisconsin joined us, we'd go from 195 to 205 when Wisconsin joins us. When Minnesota joins us, we'd go from 205 
to 215, right? And what the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact says is when states with 270 electoral votes, a majority of the electoral college have that bill in place, their electors are awarded to the candidate who wins the most popular votes in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. And we will have a national popular vote for president, right? So I would just say anybody who believes like me, whether you're Republican, Democrat, or independent, conservative, liberal, or moderate, if you believe that we need a system to elect the president that says it doesn't matter whether you live in a battleground state or a flyover state, right? That every voter in every state should be politically relevant when we elect the president of the United States and we should elect the president by national popular vote. You should quit debating, you should quit thinking, you should get on board and you should start advocating for the national popular vote interstate compact. Because I don't know a lot, but I do know a lot about this and there's only one way it's gonna happen, which is through that compact. So I just, it's, it's the only way that it's gonna happen in a bipartisan fashion, right? Bipartisan movement in support of a nonpartisan idea. You know, because we believe that a Democrat in Oklahoma should matter every bit as much as a Republican in Minnesota, right? Or we believe an independent in uh, Bismarck, North Dakota, should matter as much as an independent in Boca Raton, Florida. And under the current system we use for electing the president of the United States, that is not true, right? There are battleground state voters and there are flyover state voters. And what happens under that system, right, is we all watch how these battleground states, sometimes Wisconsin, right, count their votes, the systems they use for electing the president. You know, sometimes when we're electing a president of the United States, you think we were electing a governor of Florida or Wisconsin because you happen to be battleground states. But what happens is you get all the attention, you get all of the ads, you get all of the influence because that's a proxy for political influence right? And the rest of us are ignored. So we have a system right now that we use for electing the president where voters in one out of five states are wholly important and voters in four out of five states are totally ignored. And that happens in every presidential election, not just the divergent election, which I believe, and I believe based on my truth, which means my experience, that that leads to tribalism, lack of confidence in the system and is threatening the very fabric of American politics, American society, American culture, and the American experiment, right? That's why I'm a full-throated proponent of the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. And I am a Republican, Right? I'm not going to ask anybody else what they are, but I can promise you that I voted for a Republican candidate for president every day of my lifetime. But at the end of the day, what I want is I want a system where both parties or all parties can contest every inch of turf, fight for the hearts and minds of the American voters. The candidate with the most votes will get elected and we'll all get better at living with the results and American presidents will have the full-throated support and weight and confidence of the American voters behind them and the American citizens behind them until he or she does not, right? At which point we'll elect another president by popular vote. Now, the reason I know that national popular vote for president is not a partisan idea is because uh, there have been more constitutional amendments in the history of the country to abolish the electoral college, but to move us towards a national popular vote than any other topic, right? And many of those amendments are introduced by conservative Republicans, small state Republicans like Bob Dole. You know what I mean? These are, this has never been a partisan idea. And it's not a partisan idea today. I know through my experience, when we passed those 15 states in the District of Columbia, it was Republicans in those states that provided the winning margins often to take the bill over the top because they're concerned about this idea that there are two kinds of Americans and that battleground state voters have all the influence, that the American president is losing credibility on the domestic and global stage, right? And that it's really a dangerous system for American democracy, right? 
Republicans in Oregon, for example, provided us the winning margin to pass the bill through the Oregon Senate, despite the Democratic president of the Senate opposing the bill. Don't ask me why he opposed the bill. I'm just saying he opposed it. We got two Republicans to pass our bill because they believed every voter in Oregon should be every bit as relevant as every voter in Oconomowoc, right? Like they didn't believe that a voter in Oconomowoc should be hyper important to the American president while a voter in Portland is ignored, right? They think that's a bad idea or Salem. So I also know that prior to the 2016 election, right, we passed our bill through the Oklahoma Senate and the Arizona House. These are not democratic bodies. I don't know how much you pay attention uh, to the world of uh, uh, legislative chambers, but I can promise you Democrats do not control the Oklahoma Senate and the Arizona House, right? It was Republicans in those states that moved this bill forward because they believe that a voter in Oklahoma and Arizona should matter as much as a voter in Florida. They don't believe that battleground state voters should have all the influence. They're also concerned about the viability of this idea that we can continue to have divergent elections that rip this country apart at the seams, right? And if you don't think divergent elections do that, you know what I mean? You're probably in the wrong, well, maybe you're in the right room to learn more, but if, if, if you think everything's going well out there, you might, well, I, I shouldn't tell anybody to turn on a television because it's kind of, you know, depressing at times. But, 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 but at, at the end of the day, there's something we can do about it, right? So I just, I, I know we're not a partisan organization because my experience is we moved a bill through the Arizona House and the Oklahoma Senate. I know in the state of New York, which joined the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, I know it was the Democratic House that blocked the bill for four years. Right, because they believe Democrats had a virtual lock under the current system. They were pointing to states like Arizona and Georgia that they would be battleground states or that they would become democratic states as would Texas. And why would we change a system that we always win in? Right, and then they lived through 2016 where Donald Trump figured out a way to uh, decimate their blue wall by carrying the battleground states of Wisconsin, Pennsylvania and Michigan the first Republican candidate to do that in 24 years, and their theory was dead, right? But it was Democrats that were resisting us in New York while we passed through the Republican Senate four times before they determined that, hang on a second, one person, one vote is a foundational principle of the Democratic Party and the Democratic experience, experience that is the American form of government and ought be extended to presidential elections, right? So, I, I mean, I have since 2007, I, I know that even after the 2016 presidential election, the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact was introduced in the Michigan Senate. This was after the divergent election, the most recent run where Donald Trump won the presidential election under the state-based system without winning the popular vote in 2018, the bill was introduced in the Michigan Senate with 15 Republican sponsors and 10 Democratic sponsors. Now as election reformers who kind of pay attention to election reform issues, you tell me another election reform bill that was introduced in 2018 that had 15 Republican senators and 10 Democratic senators on the bill, a majority of both caucuses and the entire chamber. Right? So if any if anybody is confused about whether or not national popular vote is a Democrat idea or a Republican idea, whether it's a conspiracy theory on the Democratic side to win elections against Republicans or the Republican side to win it against Democrats, I can assure you it's none of those things. What the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact is, is it's an American idea and it's a political movement of Republicans, Democrats, and independents, conservatives, liberal, and moderates who believe that this idea that we live in a country that's governed by the people, right, where the power of our elected leaders is derived from the citizens of this country and who believe that one person, one vote is a foundational principle 
that sews the entire fabric of this country together and that it ought be extended to presidential elections. There's only one movement in the world that has that um, DNA, right? And it is the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. So here's what I don't feel like is an animal in the zoo, you know what I mean? On National Popular Vote is, oh my God, they found a Republican who supports the National Popular no. No, I mean, I've been at the center of this movement since 2007. I'll just give you a little bit of background about why I care. You know, the reason I care is because I've been around the American presidency, right? A couple of things that weren't in the bio there, right? And I hate bios, by the way. I, Dorothy, I love what you did with my bio. But I mean, you know, I'm like everybody else. Nobody likes talking about themselves. But, but here's the deal in terms of background, right? Movement conservative, supported Forbes over Bush right? That, that'll give you an idea of who I am politically, okay? Um, but part of my experience has been in and around the American presidency. After Forbes lost in the primaries, I supported President Bush and his campaign for the presidency in 2000, when he was elected president in a divergent election, right? So I know how presidents get elected. My life used to be centered around that kind of activity, Young man's game, don't do it anymore, right? But I'm telling you, I know how presidents, I know how people run for president. I know how they're elected president. I know how they lose the presidency under the current system, which is a state-based winner-take-all system, right? That we all know about. Um, I also know how presidents govern because when President Bush was the president of the United States, I helped him enact his domestic policy agenda, okay? So when I talk about one out of four voters being hyper relevant and three out of four voters being ignored, I'm not telling you that as a voter, I'm telling you that as a guy who knows, right, that when President Bush was running for re-election, he was polling in just 18 states the three years prior to his campaign. That means he wasn't polling in 32 states because he couldn't figure out any way to make North Dakota or Vermont relevant. Or, and, and I'll tell you, he couldn't figure out how to make California or Texas relevant because we weren't polling there either. So it wasn't big states or small states or any of the things you'll hear, right? It was because there were only 18 states that could conceivably be battleground states in the next presidential election, okay? So I know that's how campaigns are run under the current system. Some voters matters, other don't. Others don't. I don't. I don't want to say it doesn't matter if you vote. You know, it always matters if you vote. But I'm saying when we're electing a president, we're focused on what battleground state voters want. We're not focused on what flyover state voters want. Okay. And part of that came to life in our domestic policy agenda. The number one domestic policy agenda item for the Bush administration was a prescription drug benefit, a one trillion dollar entitlement program which was the largest entitlement program since Lyndon Johnson's Great Society by a small government conservative Congress led by a conservative president, okay? And I think reasonable people can be on all sides of the issue about whether or not we should be investing in free drugs for seniors. It's not about that, right? Like I don't, I don't begrudge anybody their opinion on that issue. You should have one, you should share it with your elected representative. I will tell you the reason it was our number one domestic policy priority is because we needed to lock in voters in the I-4 corridor of Florida from Tampa Bay to Daytona Beach to secure a battleground state that we had just got done winning by 527 votes, right? We know that battleground states are more likely to get disaster declarations. We know they get waivers from things like no child left behind, right? So it translates into influence. And so at the end of the day, the reason that I'm a full-throated proponent, and I think part of the conversation we have with my Republican friends who get on board is like, look, we should not have government by the battleground state for the battleground state. You know what I mean? What we should do is have this pluralistic society where we listen to and campaign to voters in all 50 states in the District of Columbia and figure out what's in the best interest 
of the American people in the country and what is of most resonance to the most voters in that single member district, right? We need to quit governing by precincts in battleground states from the White House. And I think that's a message of resonance and it's the main reason you know, that I'm here as a proponent for national popular vote. The policy implications of the current system, the cultural implications of the current system, and the toxic political environment that the current system creates, I believe is dangerous for America. And I honestly, I, I've been a student of this kind of stuff for a very long time. You know, I'm 53 now. I still think of myself as a kid. You know, been, been around for a while. And I've been, a lo- I've been around a lot of blocks related to this kind of conversation. And I have never, now I didn't live through the civil rights movement. You know, I was getting born a little bit later. And I wasn't around in 1860 in the antebellum era, right? Or the post-Civil War era. But I am telling you, I've not seen a more toxic political culture in my entire life than the one we're living in right now. And I believe that the single reform that can do the most good to bring Americans together is to elect the president by national popular vote. And I think there's only one way that's going to get it done, which is our planet, nationalpopularvote.com. And I think if you're interested, I would encourage you to sign up. You know what I mean? Write your legislator, get involved, get informed. I'm happy to answer any questions, um, but, but I'm here as an honest servant, right? Like this is, I've been able to work, I, I've been um, graced and blessed to work on kind of a lot of important things in my life. And I say that with humility and not arrogance, okay? Just a lot of great teachers find myself in the right place at the right time. There is nothing that I have worked on that is more important than this. And and I mean that. So I hope if you agree with us, I hope if you think we would need a national popular vote for president, you'll get involved, but I'm going to be happy to answer any questions. And that was probably way too long. But anyways, we got plenty of time for Q&A and uh, thanks for your time. Uh, Rosie, that was right on target. And uh, you were speaking on behalf of those Democratic voters in California (laughs) who feel like they don't count, Um, those Republican voters in Texas that feel like they don't count, and the same people in the same predicament in a lot of other states, Um, and those individual voters that feel like their individual votes should count as much as anybody else's. So Right on. So let's let's go with. Uh, we we got a lot of good questions in the chat. Um, Deborah, do you want to bring forth some of those? Sure. Thank you, Dorothy. Let's start. Deb um, Kakanis, early in your presentation, uh, Rosie asked, "Is there a legal effort to expand the meeting of one person, one vote?" beyond its current limitation to redistricting? Um, I I, I don't quite understand the question or how it pertains to national popular vote. And I do not want to present myself as an expert on redistricting, right? So like, I I just want to be very careful, but I I think it is the question, are there movements afoot to handle redistricting reform in the states or at the federal level, um, at the federal level, I'd say there's nothing that the federal government can do about redistricting because it's it, 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 along with awarding of electors, is one of those plenary powers to the state. Only the states have the power to draw districts. It's one of those states' powers in the Constitution. Um, my, my sense is there's any kind of efforts in all of the states, um, you know, to reform the redistricting process through citizen panels or stuff like that. Um, you know, there are some good models you can go look at in Michigan. Um, do I believe redistricting will have more of an impact on extending one person, one vote to presidential elections? Uh, the answer to that question is absolutely not. I think there's only one way you can do that, uh, which is through having a national popular vote for president. Um, as it relates to national popular vote, the way redistricting comes up is usually some people will say, well, you know how Maine and Nebraska elect their do their electors by congressional district, why wouldn't we do that? 
Uh, I think one of the reasons we wouldn't do that is because it takes a bad system and makes it worse, right? Instead of just battleground states, we've had battle, we'd have battleground congressional districts. And I will promise you that if um, your state, Wisconsin, for example, determined that you wanted to move to a congressional district method, right, to make less voters relevant, which I don't think there's any constitutional issue with, I just don't support the policy. Um, what you would be doing is inviting federal influence into the redistricting flight in Wisconsin. So that's how it kind of relates to my issue. And the reason I know that is because Nebraska, where they do have a congressional district system, um, you know, the Democrats uh, figured out a way to make the second congressional district competitive, right? What was the first thing the Republicans did? I guess they're all nonpartisan because it's a unicameral system there. But one of the first things they did was introduce a bill to redraw the second congressional district, right? They're trying to deal with that problem through redistricting, um, you know, because, you know, here's the deal. In California, they've had uh, bills to do a congressional district plan. Democrats oppose them. Why would they unilaterally give Republicans 18 electoral votes out of California? It doesn't make any sense. So, I mean, that's what I have to say about redistricting. Um, certainly, there are people who are involved in that. I would point anybody to maybe like, well, the League of Women Voters probably has a, has a position on that in Wisconsin. I'll leave that to them. Um, but, you know, folks like Common Cause are in the middle of that stuff. Um, you know, I'm more interested uh, in, in, in right-sizing the American presidential system. I, I think that's doing more to tear us apart than redistricting. That, uh, you know, that's my person. That's an opinion. Now, I, think, I think the questioner was referring to the fact that uh, every 10 years, we re reapportion, we, we reapportion the representation. Um, for the House of Representatives because of the requirement that um, each representative must represent an equal number of people. And that was on the basis of one person, one vote. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that's, I don't know if that's what he was asking. I think what you just said for sure is true, Dorothy, that, you, you know, the way we populate the Electoral College is based on total number of representatives in Congress. So under the state-based winner-take-all system, right, the one-way redistricting does affect presidential elections as if uh, Wisconsin gains an elector and Pennsylvania loses one, right, uh, under a national popular vote for president or if the national popular vote interstate compact were in effect, you know, that, um, that problem, if you view that as a problem would be mitigated because we would guarantee 270 electoral votes to the winner of the national popular vote under the compact. And so we'd all be voting in a single member district, right? Overnight, it'd be a single member district, all 50 states in the district of Columbia in a first past the post system. And the only purpose of the electors is to certify the result of the national popular vote election. Thank you. We also have a question about the integrity, my word, of the um, interstate compact over time, uh, given some of the attempts that we've seen of the past administration to strong arm certain state legislatures, as is being now revealed in the January 6th hearings, reneging by the signers of the interstate compact. Is that a future concern? Uh, it's not. Uh, to, for me, it's not. I mean, I, I think one thing that January 6th did show is kind of the durability of the, uh, of, of the system. I mean, the result becomes the result. I, I think what most people don't understand is that there's only one time under federal law. States control the awarding of electors there's only one time the federal government controls the count right and so there's only one time under federal law where electors can be selected or voted for which is on election day okay that's why all of the certification occurred right and what enforces the compact is what's called the impairments clause of the constitution so we're not looking for good faith electors frankly um to fulfill their promise, how the national popular vote interstate compact works. Let's just say Wisconsin's in the compact, right? And we're at 270 electoral votes and we're having an election for president. Um, the Republican candidate carries Wisconsin, but loses the national popular vote. 
The compact itself dictates that it's the Democrat slate of, uh, of electors from Wisconsin that go and fulfill what is a ceremonial duty that loyalty is tied in by party hackery, right? The Democratic Party picks their electors and they go and perform the function based on the state statute. Now, the same is true in Oklahoma, right? Or in Minnesota. A Democrat wins Minnesota, Republican wins the national popular vote. Minnesota is in the compact and we're at 270 electoral votes. It's Republicans from Minnesota that are certified and we go cast our electoral votes for the winner of the national popular vote that is the Republican candidate. And so the electors continue to perform what I believe is a ceremonial function. Um, you know, to the extent there's any, you know, faithless electors, they're always grandstanding, right? They never sort of make a difference. Um, but, you know, national popular vote returns to the current framework, asks the states if they want to have a national popular vote. We have the election in the states under state election laws. Then when a national popular vote total is added up, they certify the slate of electors before the safe harbor date. And it is the electors of the candidate, of the party of the candidate that won the national popular vote. Um, I, nobody could renege because the compact itself in 888 words says you can vote to withdraw from the compact at any time, but your withdrawal cannot take effect within a six month window, you know, starting with the nominating convention until the next president is sworn in, right? So, and what enforces that is the impairments clause of the constitution. And it's not some theory, you know what I mean? The impairments clause is the most powerful clause of the constitution. Interstate compacts, are agreements amongst the states that are contracts between the states, and no state has ever been able to withdraw from a contact a, con a compact in the history of this country without adhering to the terms of the compact. So I do think it's stuff that gets raised in parlor games. You know what I mean to try to distract people. But and it's a good question. It's a valid. I mean, it's absolutely a valid question. It's one I had, uh, but don't be distracted by it. Because if you want a national popular vote for president, there's only one way you're going to get it, which is the national popular vote interstate compact. How many states do you think are going to sign on to a constitutional amendment to elect the president by national popular vote? Right? In your lifetime, you know, if everybody who is a proponent for a national popular vote for president gets on board behind this compact and demands it from their state legislatures, we can have one. So I, compacts airtight. If we get 270 electoral votes in this agreement on July 20th of a presidential year, we will have a national popular vote for president. And I believe if we have a national popular vote for president, we'll never go back because I believe the people want a national popular vote for president, right? You make people matter in every presidential election, no matter where they win. Try to go back to the old system, see how that goes for you. We'll have new legislatures. And, and I think this issue is getting to the tipping point where if you're not for the national popular vote, you're gonna have a hard time representing your district moving forward. Because you're either afraid of two things, right? One of two things, if you're an opponent of national popular vote, you're afraid of. One is your ideas, two are your voters. And I would argue that if you're afraid of your ideas and you're afraid of voters, you need a new line of work if you're in politics. That's what, that's what it's all about, so. All right, Rosie. There are a couple of clarifying questions here in the chat. I'm gonna take some editorial privilege here and merge them together. Sure. One is about the impact of the interstate compact on the electoral college. And then one is just a clarifying question on how many states do we need and how successful can we expect to be to get those states? So um, two great questions. Um, the impact on the Electoral College is sort of minimal, right? Um, we use the power of the Electoral College and I think too many people conflate the current state-based system with the Electoral College. It is one of those um, you know, partisan myths. I'm a state, you know, everybody in this room is not a state powers conservative. We don't all agree on everything, right? That's for sure. But the reason I can be a proponent of national popular vote is because it does not strip the state of the power to award its electors. 
but it makes the most meaningful change necessary if you're for a national popular vote for president. Because the change it does make is that it says when there are 270 electoral votes worth of states in the compact, those states are gonna be awarded to the party of the candidate. That's the only difference, is what slate of electors get certified by the compacting states, right? And the slate of electors that get certified by the compacting states are the slate of electors that are loyal to the national popular vote winner, right? So in 2016, Donald Trump carried Wisconsin, got all 10 of Wisconsin's electoral votes, might have won it by what, 11,000 popular votes? I don't have my data in front of me, but it was very close. And he got all of those electoral votes. The Republicans were the certified slate of electors and they voted for Donald Trump and they took him over the top. That's the state-based winner take all law. That's not the electoral college. You won't find Wisconsin's state-based winner take all law in the United States constitution. You'll find the phrase each state uh, each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature there of them direct a number of electors. Wisconsin passed that state statute when we became a state, okay? Now, the principal change in 2016, Donald Trump wins Wisconsin, right? This is where national popular vote is different. Donald Trump wins Wisconsin. Hillary Clinton wins the national popular vote if that's the outcome that actually occurred. Right, because if you change the law, if you change the nature of the system, you're gonna change the campaign. But I don't wanna confuse anybody with that. But the principal difference is in 2016, Democrats from Wisconsin would have been the certified slate of electors because you have determined you're gonna award your electors with the other states to the winner of the national popular vote. That's the only change. Then everything else is the same again, right? You have the safe harbor date. You send the electoral votes to Congress. Congress counts the votes, but it will be the national popular vote winner that has the electoral votes because states with 270 electoral votes have this bill in place. And the bill simply says, we're gonna award our electors on the basis of the national popular vote when we have enough electors to control the system because we're not asking anybody to unilaterally disarm. So I think that's the principal difference. The electoral college is still there, but we are electing the president by national popular vote. And there's one principal difference, which is when there are states with 270 electoral votes, they're awarding their electors to make sure that we guarantee that result, okay? So that's important clarification. Uh, and I'm glad somebody asked. Um, how likely is it that we get there? I mean, here's the deal. When I started in 2007, I was like, this is going to be, once I convinced myself that I was a proponent, right? I did my homework. I applied my life's experience. I determined it was in the better interest of our country, the state, right? And the body politic to elect the president by a national popular vote. I signed up. I got involved. When I did that, I said, it'll be interesting if this happens. Now it's only a matter of time. And it's only a matter of people not getting bogged down, but really asking themselves one simple question. Do you want a national popular vote for president? If you want a national popular vote for president, there's only one way to do it, get on board. Trust me, we got the details figured out. Trust, it will operate the way it's designed to operate. And it's the only way you're ever going to get there. Everything else is a press release, right? Everything else is, I'm not going to say what I'm thinking, right? There's one way to do it. So I try to simplify sort of the voting question for your mind. Here's the deal. If you oppose a national popular vote, there's only one bill to oppose because all the rest of it's noise. That's why 100% of the people who are attacking a national popular vote for president are attacking us on a regular basis because they're afraid of the voters or they're afraid of their ideas, right? They're not attacking the constitutional amendments because they know they're going nowhere. So we'll get there. What we need is every shoulder to the wheel, right? End the parlor games, get involved, Call your legislator. 
when they knock on your door, say, hey, are you a proponent of the national popular vote interstate compact? And if they say no, tell them I'm not voting for you. That'll do more to get a national popular vote for president than anything else you can do. I'm, you know, it's really that simple. And so if I sound angry, I'm not, I'm just like, come on, let's go. What, what do my kids say? I got kids. Some of them are like under 20 and they like, now they say, let's go. You know what I mean? Let's get into it. So I don't care why you're here. If you support a national popular vote for president, get on board. Rosie, William is asking us how um, votes for third party candidates would be counted if there remain electors only for the two major parties. No, same way. I mean, every third party candidate has a slate of electors. Right. So so you need to understand, like in in like any third party candidate that qualifies for a ballot in the state of Wisconsin has a slate of electors. Right. So they get counted the exact same way ours do. Under the current system, everybody's required, every state, all 50 states in the District of Columbia are, are, are required under state and federal law to have rapid transmission results from precincts to counties, right? Protect the integrity of the ballot, precincts to counties, counties to the chief election official, official right? And then the chief election official is responsible for a canvas. And what the canvas requires is the popular vote by candidate. So. Republican candidate gets a million and a half votes. Democratic candidate gets 1.3 million votes. Green Party candidate gets 400,000 votes, right? In the state of Wisconsin, they're tallied just like every other vote. Now, third parties are not entitled to win the most popular votes in all 50 states in the District of Columbia, right? They have to go out and earn that. So. The bottom line is third parties are not treated any differently in national popular vote. If you are a third party candidate and you get the most popular votes in all 50 states, you have a slate of electors in every state that's in the compact. Those are the electors that are certified from the state. And I'll tell you, like guys like Gary Johnson, right? Libertarian Party for candidate, Bob Barr, uh, Libertarian candidate for president, uh, Ralph Nader. Green Party candidate for president. All of them have voiced support for the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. I think they believe, you know, it'll reinvigorate, you know, a third party movement in America. And frankly, if the two major parties are failing the American people, they should lose. I mean, here's the deal. The Republican Party was not always a major party in America, right? We had to, uh, we, we had to knock off the Whigs. You know, and oftentimes I hear people saying who want to defend this two party system. It's great. I happen to be a Republican. If they weren't representing me in the way that I thought was in the best interest of the country, I'd look for an alternative myself. Um, but, you know, most people are like, well, we think there should be a two party system and somehow we're locked into it. Well, let's not forget that third parties emerged under the current system. I mean, the Bull Moose Party was a third party. The Republican Party was a third party. The Democratic Party emerged out of the Jeffersonian Party, right? Like, like third parties have been a part of our political culture and will continue to be that way no matter what method we use for electing the president. Uh, but with national popular vote, the candidate with the most votes and the full-throated support of the most American voters will be the president of the United States. And if you don't like the result, I think if we all matter the same, right? If we're not worried about what is Philadelphia doing with ballots, right? Or if we're not worried about, you know what I mean? Like if we all matter, if it was like my vote in Minnesota matters as much as a vote in Wisconsin, right? I think we do a better job of living with the results, whether we won or lost, and we'll line up and beat them the next time, right? That's how, that's how it should work. That's how it works in gubernatorial races. You know, in a close gubernatorial race, I don't have to put the National Guard around the American Capitol, yet, right? Like, I mean, we live in a single member district. Sometimes the Republican wins. I, I shouldn't offend people. My first bumper sticker in my life said, Tony Earl sucks. How many people remember Tony Earl? I was the only Republican in my high school, right? When Tony Earl was elected president, I didn't like storm the Capitol. I didn't have to board up Milwaukee before the presidential election for fear that a Republican might win. 
right? Because we all mattered in that election. So that's all I'm looking for here. Uh, and I think it's critically important that we get it done. So long answer to how do we get it done? We get it done by doing it together. They can't stop us if we do it together. Hey, Rosie, what states are we targeting now to pass the compact in order to get to the 270? Oh, look, we got progress in a lot of different states. and I, I never make predictions about what state is going to go next. That's sort of the most dangerous game in the world on this thing. Um, but, you know, look, here, here's the deal. Uh, like, I can rattle off 15 states that I think are in play in the right political environment, right, that are not currently in the compact. Um, most of us are sitting in two of them right now, right? Wisconsin is a state that belongs in the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. Question is, when are we going to get organized as a movement collectively to put the pressure on the legislature to do what is in the best interest of the country in the state of Minnesota, right? So Wisconsin is a state that really belongs in the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. That's the home of La Folla. You know what I mean? Let's just get her done. I mean, it's like... But, you know, it takes time and it takes it takes uh, it takes educating people. It takes time educating the legislature and then mobilizing people to support the bill in the legislature. Minnesota belongs in the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. Minnesota will be in the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. It's just a question of when. Democrats in Minnesota killed us in 2012. You know, just like that other environment, I had 22 Republicans vote for the national popular vote bill in the House. 30 Democrats crossed over the aisle and voted against a national popular vote for president. But most of them have come home now, right? Not home for a Democrat, but home for an American. You know, we should have a national popular vote for president. And we're rebuilding sort of our coalition here. Minnesota's a great state for the national popular vote. Michigan, we had 15 Republicans and 10 Democrats, you know, passed the bill. I will say we've passed one chamber or another in eight additional states with 85, elector 85 electoral votes or 88 electoral votes. My, my apologies. That's more than the 75 we need for the compact to take effect. Two of those states are not Georgia and Missouri where I had a majority of both chambers in Georgia on the national popular vote interstate compact before the 2016 presidential election. Now, of course, divergent elections create headwinds and tailwinds, right? So it's just a matter of time at this point. And, you know, I could sit here all day long and tell you what states I think are going to be the ones that take this over the top. I know there are more than enough to get it done, particularly if everybody gets involved. All right, Rosie, we have a question. Um, it, it, we've been ruled by the minority for several elections. So that's likely why our Supreme Court is as extreme as it actually is. What's going to make this minority come out and support the national popular vote? The minority, you mean, uh, I'm, I'm confused. Are you calling me the I'm minority? Thinking, in the, I think, is, am I being called the minority in this in this question, like Republicans? Am I going to get, how am I going to get Republicans to support a national popular vote? No, I think the question is more uh, bigger, that we have had presidents who did not win the national popular vote, yeah. get, you know, be our president. So really, they were elected by the minority. Okay. So do people feel disenfranchised? Or how do we get them charged up? Oh, there isn't any question that people all over the country on both sides of the political aisle, whether they're in the majority or minority, feel like they're disenfranchised in presidential elections. I mean, like, I totally agree with that. I think, you know, I'm the minority. I voted for the Republican candidates for uh, president who didn't win the national popular vote. I don't blame the candidates. I blame the system, which is why I'm reforming the system. Right. So at the end of the day, the reason that Donald Trump won in 2016 is because he was hyper-focused on five battleground states to win under the current system we use for electing the president. The reason that George Bush was elected president of the United States in 2000 is because he spent more time and more money in Florida than 42 other states combined to win the battleground state he had to win in order to be elected president under the current system. 
if we had a national popular vote for president, those candidates would campaign in all 50 states in the District of Columbia because whether you lived in Boca Raton or Bismarck, right, Oshkosh or Orlando, Minneapolis or Butte, Montana, it wouldn't matter. Every one of us would be important to the outcome. And so if you change the nature of the system, you change the nature of the campaign. And I promise you that I believe that George Bush would have cleaned Al Gore's clock in 2000 if we took this campaign to all 50 states of the District of Columbia, right? I don't know what would have happened in 2016. I have no idea. But nothing like a national popular vote will reinvigorate grassroots politics in all 50 states in the District of Columbia than making sure that every voter, no matter what zip code they live in, matters to the outcome, right? And that will change, the, 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 that will guarantee that the candidate who has the most votes from the most Americans will be elected president and it will end the divisiveness. It will end, this question will no longer be a question because every American president will have a clear mandate from the most American voters to appoint whoever they want to appoint to the courts that can be confirmed by the Senate. I'm no more entitled to my court than you are to yours. But if you have a problem with the court right now, and I don't know anybody in America that doesn't have a problem with the court. I'm not talking about recent decisions. You know what I mean? I'm just talking about. But if you have a problem with the court right now, because there are six justices that were appointed by a president that didn't win the national popular vote, there's only one way to change that and make sure you never have to ask that question again, which is the national popular vote interstate compact. That's why it's the most important issue in my lifetime. Because at the end of the day, I'm not gonna tell you whether I agreed with the court or didn't agree with the court because I'm not here to talk about courts. But I can tell you that if that same court was appointed by a president that was elected by national popular vote, you know what, there isn't any question but that that court would be the legitimate voice of the American people which is why I spend all of my time that I have available other than the life I have to live, the business I got to run, doing stuff like this to fix the problem, not just talk about it, right? So I just think it's really important in this current environment. I think there's a reason that we have 61 people here, right? We could have had 61 people here eight years ago, right? And, and that's on all, right? but, 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 but at the end of the day, there is nothing that will fix the problem that this question is pointing to. If you believe it's a problem, then the national popular vote interstate compact and everything else is noise. There's only Patrick, one solution. On that note, and that's a good strong note, <laughs> we have to wrap up this hour together. There were scads of questions in the chat and we're just not gonna get around to all of them, but I think Deborah, you you kind of try to bunch them together to get. Can I uh, answer one more because it came up twice. Sure. Which is the question is does okay. a national popular vote for question uh, for for president cost more money? Right. I I saw it kind of flow through there a couple of times, and we get it a lot. And I know that um, you know certainly there are people in this room that believe money in politics is a very serious problem. Um, you know the answer to that question is I I I think the answer to that question is there may be more money available to campaign in all 50 states in the District of Columbia, but it'll be the right kind of money. You know what I mean? It'll be grassroots money. It will be grassroots power. Because at the end of the day, what's gonna happen is Minnesota money will stay in Minnesota fighting for every voter in Minnesota. Wisconsin money will stay in Wisconsin voting for every voter in Wisconsin. Montana money will stay in Montana fighting for every voter in Montana because how much you win or lose every one of those states now is what is vital and important to the outcome of the brand standard election. Notice I didn't say the most important one because I don't believe it's the most important one, right? I don't believe the presidential election is the most important one, but I believe it's the one that has the biggest impact 
on the political ecosystem. And so, look, if you think money in politics is a problem, it's because all of the special interest money comes in to try to win battleground states under the current system. And I'm not a scientist, but I know the solution to pollution is dilution. Right. And if you dilute that across all 50 states, building strong chapters of the League of Women Voters, strong parties of all kinds in all 50 states in the District of Columbia, we'll have a reinvigoration of grassroots, grassroots politics that is essential to the future of our country. That is my opinion. I mean, I, I'm saying that as a statement, but I, there's nothing I believe to be more true than that. And so here's what I know about presidential candidates and campaigns. They raise all the money they have available to them. And they figure out how to spend it based on what's going to allow them to win a race. Do you believe that money should be concentrated in all 50 states and the District of Columbia fighting for the hearts and minds of every American voter? Or should they be concentrated in five battleground states trying to tell them whatever they want to hear? You know, kind of a no brainer for me, but you know, I'm a flyover state voter behind the blue wall in Minnesota. So uh, that's my confession to the group. <laughs> there you go. Good point. Well, everybody, this has been an excellent uh, thought provoking discussion. I appreciate the attention and scrutiny apparent from the audience's uh, questions and comments. Again, the recordings of our four NPV webinars will be posted on the Wisconsin League's website and YouTube page, YouTube page, YouTube, YouTube page shortly after they occur. Our next NPV webinar entitled The National Popular Vote, Other States Stories, and we'll hear about Florida and Oregon amongst others, will take place on July 27th. It will feature Kathleen Crampton, who heads uh, LWV Florida's campaign for the national popular vote, and Elizabeth Donnelly, who headed Oregon's successful campaign to get the national popular vote interstate compact passed by the Oregon state legislature. We'll wrap up the series on September 14th with a webinar on the action steps titled The National Popular Vote, Get It Done in Wisconsin. So thanks, Patrick, Rosie. I'll call you Rosie because I want to be your friend. <laughs> and uh, thanks to all of the attendees and everybody who helped uh, make this webinar possible. So um, good evening, and we'll see you again on July 27th.